I am Adriano Berengo, and I am your co-host today with the, with the Listen Gallery. First of all, I would like to welcome you, all of you, to this exhibition, Genius Loci, the Spirit of Place. My sincere thanks to Listen Gallery for this amazing show. I would like to welcome you to our panel discussion on Genius Loci. I have the honor of introducing our panelists to you. All of our panelists are very accomplished in their own right, and I'm sure well known to many of you, so I'm not going to even try to list all their projects and achievements, just give you a highlight. Let me introduce first our moderator, Edwin Heathcote an architect who has been the architectural design critic for the financial time since 1999. Edwin is the author of many books and articles, including his most recent book called The Meaning of Home, which I understand from his Twitter profile is very affordable. <laughs> <laughs> Joanna Vasconcelos, who has been a frequent guest in Venice since uh, 2005, when she exhibited her colossal chandelier in the Biennale and another uh, in the Palazzo Grassi. Last year, she represented Portugal in the Venice Biennale of Art with a floating pavilion, a Lisbon ferry boat, dressed up in blue ceramic tiles, Joanna was in glass dress in 2013 and with us at Berengo Studio created a toy house in glass for this show. Kuhn van Mechelen, a Belgian artist. Uh, Kuhn is a conceptual artist from Belgium whose work, the Cosmopolitan Chicken Project, has been exhibited in museums and galleries around the globe, including Listen Gallery, in 2001, if I'm not mistaken, 2000 to 2001. And whose work in here is, in genius launching glass, is the captivity, eggs in cages. When we first talked about this panel, I was going to tell you about Kuhn's journey from glass to art, and from art to architecture. But Kuhn is here, and I will let him speak for himself. Richard Wentworth has played a leading role in new British sculpture since the end of the 70s. His work around motion of objects and their use as part of our day-to-day -day experiences has altered the traditional definition of sculpture as well as photography. He is considered one of the most influential artists in Britain. Aldo Chibing, a distinguished architect whose project Rethinking Happiness was presented in the 10th Venice Biennale of Architecture. Aldo Chiping Studio is composed of architects, designer, and known internationally for, it, for its project, as he described them, of a different nature. In Milano, he presented iron and hemp houses, architecture of eco-sustainable materials. Andy Groke, I hope I pronounced it well. Uh, he's a director of Carmo de Groek, an award-winning London-based architectural studio with a strong reputation for a diverse range of cultural projects in the public realm, including the permanent memorial to the 7th July bombing in Hyde Park. In 2013, the firm received an award from the Royal Institute of British Architects for the firm's filling station project, a temporary piece of architecture. Greg Hilty, the curatorial director of Listen Gallery. Greg is the curator of Genius Loci, and his talent is evident from this exhibition. Greg has been with Listen since 2008, and has curated a significant number of international exhibitions with all the major artists in the gallery. We are looking forward to a lovely discussion uh, on the Genius Lodges. Thank you to each of our panelists, and later I invite you to stay for lunch.
what a lovely uh, place to be doing a, a talk on, uh, on Genius Loci. And it's a, Genius Loci is a very interesting thing, I think, in architecture and art, because we've, we've abstracted the concept of, of the Genius Loci so that it, it means a spirit of a place as a kind of uh, psychogeographic term. It means now for us uh, a spirit, a sense of where you are. But 2,000 years ago in, in, Rome, in the Roman civilization that spawned it, it was a figure. So the spirit of a place was, was a character. He was a, uh, a, a little deity. Um, and people would give tribute to them. He would be a deity at the crossroads, sometimes represented by uh, the figure of a snake because the snake was the thing that was the closest to the ground, so that, that was the kind of ideal uh, representation of, of the spirit of a particular place. Uh, or occasionally a cornucopia, you know, because it was a, it was a kind of... Uh, uh, people would pile little offerings up to the, to the spirit of the place, usually at a crossroads. And because it was at the crossroads, there's a kind of satanic uh, uh, influence to it as well. So it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. It's a thing that can bring you benefits, but it's also something that's a little a little nerve-wracking, maybe like the Robert Johnson blues legend, you know, that you have, a, you have a, 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 a choice of places to go from the crossroads. You can go the wrong way or the right way. Uh, I think I'd, I, I'll stop now, but I will ask a little about where we are. We, we, we came past the um, Ai Weiwei installation, and it's a, that, that to me is a, is a brilliantly uh, executed uh, a piece of genius loci, because this is the one city in the world where you can't cycle. Uh, there's a kind of correspondence, I think, between the, the, the kind of complex structure of the Academia Bridge by the military engineers, not architects, but engineers, and the, and the structure of the bicycles. And yet, I know this is something that's been in, in, in uh, Castle and, uh, and it's been in bigger versions elsewhere. So it, in a way, it's, a lot of these objects that we see around us are international kind of global art objects. Somehow, made to fit a space, adapted to fit a space. So if I start with you, Greg, and just ask a little about how did you come about this exhibition? Why Genius Loci? Well, we were invited by Adriano, by Patrizia, uh, who had worked with a number of our artists, with Shirazé Hushiari particularly, uh, on a work that was shown in this space in our Glass Dress exhibition last year. They do exhibitions uh, regularly here. And they asked, um, through this uh, conversation that we had, if we would like to do a show, Listen Gallery likes to do projects as part of representing uh, over 40 artists. We like to do projects that extend the uh, context uh, of their art in illuminating ways. And uh, they asked if we do something for the, at this time, the time of the Architecture Biennale. Last year we presented two exhibitions, one of Shirase's work, one of Ai Weiwei, you see images there, uh, in Zueka projects and a church and in the Arsenale. And so we're very up for doing that, but I th we had to really question the point of doing something in the architecture biennale. And having questioned it, we decided that we, that we should, uh, precisely because many of our artists, uh, most I think, have, I mean, obviously draw the, the content of their work from the public realm, and many of them put it back. Uh, and many of them, more than just working in the public realm, uh, a number of our artists at different generations since Nicholas uh, founded the gallery in the late 60s have helped define the public realm and, and arts engagement with architecture. Lawrence Wiener, mm -hmm. Daniel Buren, um, Dan Graham, you know, these were key people at taking art kind of out of the hallowed precinct of the museum and into public space. The British sculptors, Richard has had this yeah. fascinating dialogue uh, using a kind of play between image and object of engaging uh, with both professional and, let's say, amateur uh, ways of articulating the public realm uh, for, for many years. Anish Kapoor, similarly. So, uh, and then to a later generation of people who are represented here, you mentioned Ai Weiwei, also Santiago Sierra, who maybe take a more overtly political engagement. So one thing I just want to pick up on what you said, you talk about the genus loci, and I'm going to call it that because as we know, the Romans were, were British, so we can use the English pronunciation. Um, the idea of the genus loci being a, a thing or an object or a figure, and for us to do an exhibition here, it seemed what we could bring was, was objects, artworks, and so... Um, you know, there, there are sculptures, there are Richard Deacon's uh, ceramic works, but we've also tried to show the way that that in individual vision and that individual object can translate into the public realm. So that's the premise of this show that maybe makes it uh, different from other projects in the architecture yeah. Okay, okay. Just before we, we sat down, Joanna was telling me about a, a project for the last um, art Biennale last year. 
which was apparently extraordinarily, I was amazed to, to, to learn from her, that it was the first floating, uh, moving floating pavilion that had been done for any Biennale in Venice, and it was a, a boat that you'd, you'd brought over. Now, there's a specific situation in this city, isn't there, where you have a genius loco, which is to do with movement across the water. I wonder if you could tell us maybe a little about that. Project. Well, um, I think uh, when I was thinking about this show, that my project last year was exactly the theme of this show. Mm -hmm. Because um, when I came to Venice and I talked to the Biennale people, um, and when I was invited by the Portuguese government, I had two problems. No money and no pavilion. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> these two problems, I had to solve them. And I thought, well, I might as well look into Lisbon City and see what characterizes my city, which is the river, and very similar to Venice, which the water controls the city. So I said, well, I might as well do something that connects both, both cities, and I will bring a boat, the, a very poor boat that was being you know, th thrown apart and be sold in bits. And I said, well, I might as well bring this boat that characterizes the city of Lisbon and bring it to Venice. So I came to Venice, and I asked the Biennale people, I said, well, how many projects of boats you guys have been having all over the years? And they said, well, well, a few of them, well, the Mexicans never arrived because they sink next to the Laguna. <laughs> then they, we have Rossi with a, a, a boat that was parked and that operas and yeah. theater. It was a, an amazing uh, well, project. And suddenly they said, well, but nobody ever moved the boat in Venice. And I said, how? Come on, guys, tell me there was somebody else. And I said, well, no. And suddenly I felt this strange feeling, which is, you need to connect with the places. The places have certain characteristics and public space, and the public space in Venice is water. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was very strange for me that nobody would connect with the water of Venice and with the local life of Venice, which everything happens in the Laguna in the Grand Canal, like this palace. And so uh, it was very funny because the Biennale people took me to all these meetings and made it happen because it was so strange, international laws, embassies, mayors, and so everything was very strange to get permits to float and to move a boat into the Laguna. It was a very strange object. And so it became a huge uh, project in Portugal. It became also an uh, important thing because I'd had, I didn't have money. So I went to the TV and I made some interviews saying, if the Portuguese want me to go to Venice, you might as well help me. So everybody called me and have me sending me money, people sending me money, calling me, said, we're going to help, you're going to get to Venice. So it became like a project of Portuguese rising up and standing for their artists. So it was amazing because the city of Lisbon and the mayor of Lisbon came, and in a way, he was very proud that the two cities would connect yeah. within an artwork. So I think it pretty much goes into the, the yes, idea uh, of this show. <laughs> I think that's something very interesting you raised, the, the idea of the public involvement in the art project, because it can, you know, we all know that although we're in this world, contemporary art can be obscure. Um, and I wonder what responsibility all of us have, and I, I'm not asking this for any one individual, but if anyone would like to answer, what responsibility we have to make public art accessible, if any, or is it, is it just something that is there and if people like it or understand it, that's fine. If they don't, it doesn't matter. Who's going to go for that? Mm -hmm. Aldo, what do you think? <laughs> Repeat me the last part. Just... Is there a responsibility when we make public art, which is different to when we make art for the gallery, where people go to a gallery with certain expectations? If we make it for the city square, the city street, is there a, is there a responsibility to provoke, to make it easy to understand, uh, or, or not at all? I think we were discussing before about who is the public. Yeah. Who is the public is a, a regime, or the public is from the top or from down. So I think that anyway, there is somebody giving a uh, commissionaire to, to ask for the RPs, because um, have, when you make an, a new development, I mean, there, there is a developer, there is the administration, and there is the architect. And usually, they, many times, they forget the art. So, the, uh, but the community is going to live there, and nobody's thinking of the life of the people. So I can dream that 
you make something that becomes the life of the people, that becomes something that you grow and you have something that you remember for all your life as something that you pass in front. We, um, we are involved in a strange project for the Expo Milano mm -hmm. that they do an eatery, a restaurant for the poor people in a place outside Milano. Okay. That the main thing of this place is the station of the train and the train passing all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's the monument of the place, is the train. All the life mm -hmm. is the train passing. They die, they suffer, they enjoy, and the train's passing. It never stops. Well, the priest there was a nice movie by the priest of this place that you understand how something like the train passing is a symbolic element mm. making a community. So uh, the concern is the community because you hope that this community, I, I can imagine that in a, in a regime they are oppressed in, with Mussolini monument, you are oppressed by something and you spend your life oppressed by something that you, you, you had always maybe become nice to you, but yeah. was something that was born as something oppressive. So it's very interesting from the, the kind of involvement that can be casual. Yeah. So it, the question you have done, in my opinion, is not if it's right or wrong, mm -hmm. is what you make that is something that is a present for a community for, a, for, a, 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 for decades. Yeah for a community growing, changing, modifying, that you have always a nice memory. And when you're old, when you're young, you, you have this perception because you need the artistic element as something, as something enriching or anyway, giving something to your life. I'm just going to turn that to you, Andy, for a moment because there's a particular uh, job which, which was mentioned in the intro, the, um, the memorial to the bombing victims in London which has a, a, a obviously an extra level of responsibility through the charged nature of the, of the work. It has to commemorate, but it also needs to be uh, uh, something that's, that has a kind of beauty to it because it's, a, it's an artwork as well as a memorial. Are there, how, how did you cope with those kind of conflicting demands and, the, and, the, and the, either the symbolism and a lot of things actually which maybe artists can ignore because they're much freer than when you're, when you're dealing with relatives of, of the dead. Um, well, um, speaking as one of the architecture delegates on the panel, um, I'm, I'm going to give it a, an architectural slant rather than a, an artist slant. Um, and the reason I say that is that um, that particular project that we're incredibly proud to have worked on um, was, was the result of an a open ideas competition and we found out once we'd been selected that we were the only one architect of um, against eight other artists um, who presented ideas for the uh, permanent memorial to the 7th of July bombings <coughs> and um, our, our approach for that particular project was to say um, we think it would be impertinent to uh, propose an idea on behalf of a group of people uh, who were dealing with a very confused bereavement. Um, and, and so it, it got us to reflect um, what, what we should propose in the situation to get us selected. And, and we proposed a process of listening and consultation and understanding issues of place, understanding responsibilities of time scale, who is our who is our client, uh, is it our bereaved families, is it society as a whole, is it society as a whole in memoriam. And we realized that um, architecture uh, has a, a, a sort of paradoxical responsibility to not only the people that are uh, engaging with it on a day-to-day -day level, the here and now, but also um, how a piece of work in the public realm becomes relevant in perpetuity for generations to come. We realized that, that, um, we realized that the, the architecture uh, must engage with not only its place, but also its purpose and its constituency. And that's an evolving thing. And we think that good architecture is, is about a negotiation between people and place 
And so the sense of place is incredibly critical. And it got us to reflect, um, even though the language of the memorial is derived through a kind of almost language of abstract art, it's 52 pillars. Um, and indeed, um, towards the end of the process, we consulted with an artist on the meaning and its making. We consulted with uh, sculptor Anthony Gormley. And it fundamentally made us realize the differences between perhaps the architect's contract with their work and perhaps the artist's contract with their work. And at the risk of um, an incredibly gross generalization, and I, I don't mean that all artists or architects work in this way, but we, we kind of came to a realization that um, often an artist has um, a contract with their work and their self. Um, they, they dream up an idea, they make it, and they put it out there for, for um, uh, critique or to sell or to... Um, and we, we, as architects, like to do the... the um, we dream of doing the same, but our, we realise that our commission goes beyond not only our, our immediate client, it goes beyond this time and this place. Um, and so we have to project kind of different issues that are, that are more than just physical. Um, um, they, they, they're, they're societal, they're, they're cultural, and, and they deal with ambiguities about um, time and place, which for architects we find really interesting in mm -hmm. terms of genius, genius loci. Um, well, I agree with uh, what you're saying, but I do not agree in something. I think great artists, uh, when they do their project, they do not think for public spaces. They do not think only for uh, themselves or their own purpose. And um, uh, it, for me, I have an experience, but I might as well share with you. Uh, when I was invited to Versailles, to make a show in Versailles, I had these two monsters behind me, Jeff Koons and Murakami, that mm. preceded me. And they did this show, and they told me, you know, you're the first woman, and you know, you had these guys before you, so you might as well take care. And the first thing they presented to me was the numbers, how many visitors they had in Versailles mm. during that period. I said, well, I'm not, you know, I don't care about the numbers. I must care about doing the nicest show that I can. So I worked for a year, and then I did my show, and then everybody was happy, and everything went well. And later on, the director changed, and they called me. They said, you know, you had more visitants than Tutankhamon. And I said, what? <laughs> when was that show? And in the 70s. So I had a million six hundred thousand people in Versailles, and my colleagues had like 900,000 and 850,000 people. <laughs> And so they said, how the hell did you double the numbers? I said, I don't know how the hell I did. I just did my job, you know? <laughs> so in a way, and the numbers were stronger. In a way, the numbers were so strong in the beginning, I never thought of them. But it was very important for a touristic uh, building and a very uh, specific building of the world, which is Versailles. The numbers were stronger than the aspect of being an artist. Or, yeah. uh, so yeah. suddenly the numbers became like a weight that I had to carry, but I didn't thought of it. But then people start asking me, how, did the, uh, how in the hell you did it? And I, you know, I've been thinking about it. And you know what I think today is that I integrate the space the best that I could. I didn't impose, I integrate the space. I didn't impose my work. And being European makes a hell of a difference because I know the culture, I know the aesthetics of the palace. And so in a way I chose better the pieces. So they just went in through the architectural space in a more, um, integrated way. I don't know how to say this uh, in another way. So I think that made a difference. Okay. Sorry, I, I'm so sorry. Richard's sitting on the edge here because he, he feels this is a bit like the McCarthy witch hunts with us <laughs> lined up here. So I, I, ought to get, I ought to get him in. Absolutely. I, I'm only sitting on the edge because my back hurts. Um, uh, I just wanted to ask Andy something because uh, um, None of us put Versailles there, uh, and most of us know how Versailles got there. But when you were asked to make this memorial um, in London, could you influence where it was? So 
the specific site, and I, I think you should tell the audience where it is, because that's really what we're talking... I think its awareness is as a huge yep. part of its whatness. Um, well, first of all, the, the four bombs in terrorist bombs in London went off in four separate locations. Many of you may know that. Um, it was decided that um, the site of the memorial, uh, which was which was Hyde Park, uh, one of the biggest public spaces in central London, um, was an important location for that memorial because it was distinct and separate from um, any of the sensitivities of the other four locations. Um, it, I think it's true to say that a, a public space makes you confront a piece, architecture or art, in a very particular way. And, and to an extent, when you're in public space um, and the signs and symbols of certain parts of pub public space, whether they be kind of park benches or park paths or, or fences or, or what have you, there's a certain state of preparedness about what, um, what you're perhaps going to receive as an experience, artistic or not. Um, and, so, and so to an extent, uh, we, we were kind of blessed with a site or an area to, to study and, and eventually knit in, in a hopefully a meaningful way, how this <laughs> grafts itself into the park. Um, it's the, it sits at the only path of um, several hundred paths in the park that was severed um, when the Hyde Park um, Park Lane construction um, demolished actually Cromwell's um, uh, uh, earthwork wall um, of you know several hundred years earlier, and um, and so we were kind of trying to graft a certain meaningful um, placement of this piece back in. I think it, it's also fair to say that even even though a work such as that, we were blessed with having a a place where people were in a state of preparedness. I don't think we can take for granted that even though we're saying it as a public work um, and, and sort of instructing as such in our own minds, we can necessarily take for granted that anyone who is um, engaging with the city on that particular moment um, is, is in a similar state of preparedness or, or has the same interpretation of what we intend. Yeah. So the meaning of the making is, is a really interesting kind of cross-boundary subject, I think, between art practice and architecture practice. One, one of the, the most interesting um, uh, juxtapositions, or, or, or I know it's not an accident because we talked about this at the time, but one of the bombs in London went off on the top deck of a double-decker bus. And one of the things it seems to me that animates the memorial most movingly is that you see the buses through it. You, you look through this, through the, the, the pylons, or I can't remember what you call the, the verticals, yeah. and, and there is the little glimpse of red mm. moving through it. It's, it's, it's a kind of incredibly poignant thing. And in the way, it's, it's not exactly an accidental, but it's, the, it's, uh, it's how the background is integrated into the art. Yeah. Art, architecture. It's an element of uh, intention and fortuitousness that luckily is part of how things happen. Yeah. You know, and I think I just come back to this question of responsibility happily through the examples that people are giving. I think we're getting a sense that there's no right or wrong answer to your yeah. question, which is a perfectly reasonable question. It comes up often. And we had a panel last week, and it, it kind of sidetracks things because the point is that it's, it's layered, you know, thank God, and it's, yeah. uh, it's complicated. And obviously, as individuals, we have a responsibility to communicate meaningfully with each other if we want to. Uh, as citizens, we have equal responsibilities. Uh, if you're working in a public project, then you have different responsibilities and there are different methods of, of realizing it. And maybe, as Andy says, there are functional responsibilities. An architect has a certain kind of contract and an artist has another. But just one uh, quick kind of equation, I think it's important to put to this, because I think there is no recipe, really, or, or right or wrong answer, uh, Anish Kapoor, yeah. who's very well known for his work in the public realm, has, uh, did a work, uh, made a work in our last gallery show, uh, which was called uh, Anxious. And he had a, he's very interested in spiritual places like Uluru and uh, did some research and recognized that 
there was a sonic uh, frequency that characterized these places. There was a sound. You, uh-huh. If you took a kind of sound meter, you, you would find that that, that uh, was common to both haunted and spiritually powerful uh, yeah. places. And what he tried to do in the gallery was to uh, bring the sonic frequency in and create the, uh-huh. the haunted or anxious feeling. Uh, so it was a kind of uh, uh, fiction, uh, but he was trying to achieve something. So I think the point, so from that experimental immaterial uh, interest of his, I think there's a line you can draw to the work here, door, which is a, an object, but he calls it a non-object. And especially seen here, oh, it's a kind of totem and an icon, but it also sucks in the space and it's much more about experience than about objectness. And then if you translate that to Cloudgate, his probably most famous public sculpture, you know, if you go from a very personal experiment and process and view into the public realm, I think that's maybe an interesting equation to look at. He didn't approach Cloudgate thinking, I've got to make the people of Chicago happy. I mean, that was part of his brief, but, um, or, or that I've got to make an iconic object. He was taking a, an artistic passion and a vision and putting it on a public stage. Now, forgive me, I, I, I will ask, well, I'll come back to you in a minute, but I just want to um, uh, uh, carry on with this for a minute because um, Anish Kapoor is an, inter- is, a, is an interest of mine because I don't like his art at all. But I, I, he, is a, he is a good public artist, so the cloud gate is indisputably an extremely popular thing because people like nothing better than seeing themselves reflected. That's the, kind of the, the vanity of contemporary society. But it is quite interesting how... He didn't just put a mirror. Up bad. No, he didn't. Yeah. No, he didn't. But it, it, it's your. There is a very different um, <coughs> aspect to a public project. You have to. You have to appeal to a different sensibility. Very. It's a very different sensibility. Now I'm going to. Oh, sorry, I'm not going to go on with that. It's not me. Not me who's talking. Kun, now th- uh, this is the cosmopolitan chicken we're going to talk about here, which is, I, I, I suggested at the beginning is the exact opposite of what we're talking about. It's the. It's a. It's a generic universal chicken that you're that you're breeding. Um, uh, <laughs> which is, you know, utterly against it. Seems to me the, th- the theme of what we're talking about. But explain why what you told me earlier, which is why it's not. It's actually very much about the, the points. Yeah. So um, yeah, cosmopolitan chicken is not actually the opposite of what we are discussing because we are discussing engagement. If you if you breed a living object as a piece of art, you know, you have a big engagement. That's 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 one. So you need a place. And then we come to the second step, because I think that places has to seduce you. And then I'm coming back to the snake, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, when I go somewhere, I'm always searching for the snake, you know? Yeah. So I was, um, when I came here in Venice, for example, in, oh, it's in the 80s, I think. Uh, so I was seduced. I was seduced by the island, paradisically. So the temptation was there, you know? There was like the, this glass factory, and I was, tr- I was trying to make a universe, you know, yeah. uh, a transparent one, you know, and uh, so inside there was already life, and from that life it starts to, it starts to grow in a project, which, which is this cosmopolitan chicken project, where I'm selecting um, these animals from all over the world, and I discover, you know, that, um, that they reflect a culture. So, uh, my work today in this crossbreeding is telling about uh, bio and cultural diversity. So it is cosmopolitan. And um, I see that every place where I'm coming now, so I, I'm going to make a studio which is called La Biomista, and it was a formal zoo in Belgium. <laughs> so the zoo is completely disappeared, but the spirit of the place is still there, you know? And um, so there, there is an old villa. Uh, where I will bring uh, foundations together, where we bring art and science together, where we are dealing with life genetically, you know? Uh, Because today, I think the very important thing is that more and more we become transparent. So we come from outside, we go into inside. And I think that's a very important thing, you know, because we are building life. It's also a very dangerous thing, and we have to question that. And every architect today has to question this with the space. Um, so I will, I, I will first n- take this old villa to, to, to discuss all these kind of uh, uh, subjects, and then we will build a space, uh, a studio, like a factory. And I met Mario Botta, he becomes a friend, and he will... Um, you will make my, my studio, but we, we will do it with uh, biological materials. Materials. It will. 
in a way it will be banal right you know yep. it will be banal but it fits to the space and it will uh, we will make it with uh, with wood chips um, and with uh, with wood that we find on that space and i think there is a conversation there is a conversation with uh, uh, with uh, with the space with the architect with the project and it's going to be a cultural park. It's going to be another kind of, of, of zoo, one where we can discuss this. And, and your ultimate hybrid chicken itself, the yeah. final product, what, what is the, beyond being a conceptual piece in itself, mm. what, what do you do with the final chicken? Do you eat it? Or well, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, we what don't eat it. We, we celebrate uh, in the beginning, because I started with a typical Belgian chicken and a yeah. French one. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And um, so we celebrate... So in the Flem Flemish, Belgian and French, or what, or what Well, there is a... The, <laughs> let's say there is the junction already. I didn't want to step in this kind of, uh, of discussion. I know we, uh, that we have this. Okay. But, you know, we celebrate the race that that this is um, this is like the end of the race mm -hmm. and so the, the the is the celebration of the hybridity yeah and I think I think that's an important step and this is actually what we did in the listen gallery in 2000 so so we, we did the mix there and then we we went a step further like uh, like with that result we mix the English one you know, yeah. and this mm -hmm. is how we become cosmopolitan. And I believe in a cosmopolitan renaissance in a way. The Euro, the, Euro chicken. Actually. Yeah. Well, Euro. I mean, it's a, it's a world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's what you. I'm sure you know that the original chicken had a Malaysian passport. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's true. Yeah, the, it's, the true. it's true. It's true. It's a jungle bird. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know. Five hundred years of people no, like no. you working on it. <laughs> I, know, I, I know this very well because I do expeditions to the Himalaya to see where it lives. Really? And what is, yeah, what is an important thing about it is that um, it lives on the border between civilization and jungle. And it's exactly the position of an artist, I think. He has to walk on the line between jungle and civilization. And that's where you comment the world. I, I mean, it's, a, it's really important to make comments and not critics, because otherwise there is no space for evolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's where you catch the engagement, you know? And um, I, I'm a, I mean, the position of this is, is a very important question. The question is, uh, did this animal come to us or did we come to the animal? And this question, the whole domestication thing. And then we go on a very spir uh, spiritual level. And um, because, you know, what is our position? Can we do, can we do with nature what we are doing? Uh, can, we, um, can we use it? Uh, where is the point that we start to abuse, you know? And all these kind of questions are very important, I think. And, and, and also in architecture today, you know, about spaces. So you have to feel the space. You have to, you have to know what you do. Every aggressive act is wrong, I think, today. You know, you know, you, 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 you take aggression, and in, in, in aggression, you know, it, 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 you ruin spaces. Mm. In, in a way, Richard, um, to come to you a little late, forgive me, 40 minutes into the talk, uh, your work is also about this kind of mongrelization. So you have a, a, your, you have a lovely little show here, which I believe you've been working hard on for a week photographing little, well, hard-ish on <laughs> for a week, photographing little details. And a lot of them are, are just, you know, delightful building details, but a lot of them are, are exactly these kind of hybridizations. They're, they're adaptations. People, they, they celebrate the kind of ingenuity of living in the city, don't they? In a way, they are public art themselves. So you're, you're identifying them as public art, but the people are the artists. I, I think... <clears throat> This is the chicken's a good theme, I think, because um, uh, it's a, it's adapt or die, and um, uh, the world is incredibly f uh, formalized, and the, that, that formalization comes a bit from politics, a bit from uh, technology, a bit from architecture. It, there's a right side of the road to drive on. But when there's nobody on the other side, you can try the other side, see what happens. Um, so we, we don't really live by rules. Um, and in fact, there are important moments when you should change to the other side of the road. Um, and when you're confronted by a kind of Nuremberg trial 
arrangement of microphones. Somebody might want to sit at the edge. Um, but that destroys the, the, the sense that we're in court, uh, which is not my intention. But, you know, we arrived here, you can't see this, but we arrived here and there was a very nice, gracious row of tidy bottles and clean, we call them glasses, but they're actually plastics. And uh, it's chaos. Some people have drunk a little, some people have drunk a lot. No one has spilt anything yet. There's electrics down the back. I'm waiting for it. <laughs> so the, the world is very contingent, and I, uh, I can't do better than say that I enjoy its contingency. The, in a way, your display on the, on the, the timber walls there, the, the rough kind of scaffold hauling timber walls, uh, fits in quite nicely with uh, Rem Koolhaas's theme of, of, of architecture, not architects, which I think he means not star architects. So you're not I, I asked him what he was doing and he gave me a drawing and I, I just copied it. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> but it is true and it's one of the fascinating things looking at, at the, your project that um, you know, there are images from all over the world, from Istanbul, from yeah. Afghanistan, from uh, Caledonian Road in London and you can't always tell which is which, which is great, is the sort of uh, the specific, the generic is part of your theme, and I guess that is where it relates to the theme of the Biennale. Yeah, mm. yeah, no, absolutely. Um, have you have you all been around the uh, the architecture Biennale? No time. No, no, no time. time. I won't ask any more. Tell us about it. Can you bring it here? <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing about it that I, having looked yesterday, and I wonder if you'd comment or others, is the the central pavilion with objects. One of the reasons why it seems to work as a show is that it's objects. Yeah. And it's representing architecture is tricky because, you know, you're either in a building or you're representing it through drawings or diagrams or film or performance and it's always a bit unsatisfactory. But having the objects on the one hand is um, makes it a great show, but is it a good way of representing architecture? What do you think of that? I think it's incredibly difficult to represent architecture, as you're saying, and I, I think it, it comes down often to, a, to a, one of the fundamentals of, of, of how we imagine and how we make work, and the, the, there's often, to practice as an architect, there's often a fundamental disconnect between what, um, what is imagined and what is made, whereas often the, archite the artist can um, have processes which directly connect them more to the work themselves. Um, so this this quality of craft and making is mm. is is a frustrating distance mm. um, from from architecture uh, and architects' process. Also, the 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 scale at which we're having to imagine our operative strategies and and think at not only constructive scales but spatial scales and, and urban scales and, and you can never be fully connected, hope to be fully connected to mm. the process of, of physically making urban scale things. Um, C can I just say one quick thing that connects to this? I, I mean, maybe all of this, this sort of hilarity of, you know, which year are we in? Oh, is it architecture or is it art? I, I get so confused. Um, it's just because since the 19th century and the ridiculous professionalization of everything, you're this kind of lawyer, you're that kind of dentist, you're this kind of surgeon, you're that kind of farmer, uh, the chicken's fate, if you like. Mm. Um, we've forgotten that people are extraordinarily capable and inventive and uh, they don't have to have the word artist or architect written in their yeah. passport. Um, so a, a lot of the anxiety that you can feel in here and uh, uh, around the discussion is, be is because of this slightly odd idea that, um, oh, I think she's one of those and I think he might be one of them and yeah. um, he's got funny spectacles so he's probably a curator. Um, <laughs> this is not, it's really not helpful and, w and, and it, it, ultimately I suppose I, I would put in a plea for a the, the word university is a lovely word, you know, it's, mm. it's uni and versity. And it's not uh, dice and slice. Mm. 
and a lot of what we're talking about is this, you know, we'll have to get the architect in. Mm. What, what I think is, is very interesting about this year's the, the Fundamentals Pavilion is that Coolhouse is suggesting that the architect has become enfeebled, has become powerless. And in fact, he lives in a world of components, of a world of objects. And actually, the architect is almost uh, an irrelevance. You know, anyone could assemble, any, any contractor could assemble from these components a perfectly decent building. Um, and it, it's a kind of uh, cry, it seems to me, a cry of, of powerlessness. Coolhouse has power because of who he is, and there are five or six of his contemporaries who have this power. But it's, it seems to me a, a kind of um, uh, 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 an existential crisis in architecture. I mean, I'm not saying it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a show of crisis. I'm not saying it's a bad show. I think it's a wonderful show. But it does reveal a kind of insecurity, I think, in, in the power of design. Maybe it's taking something to an extreme yeah. point, just so you can pull back. Aldo was talking yesterday about some of your work being not about objects or you know, yeah. uh, things like yeah. that at all, but more about a social process of engaging with people and communities right. and economies. Yes, because in, in a way, you say that the architects are not important, uh, just speaking about architecture, the architectural elements. So, uh, just to take that, in a way, one track on that sense is that I say, I don't care, so is that I don't care about architecture, I yeah. care about the life of the people. I care about the life of the community. Mm -hmm. It happens in a suburb, it happens in a new community, in the middle of nowhere, of the nature, or mm -hmm. wherever. So, uh, the problem is symbolic of how you establish a place where you live, yeah. how re you re-establish a place where you live, and what are your needs, which are architecture, of course, I'm not a great architect, maybe, so I can call a good architect, but my concern is how is the, the seed that you're going to try to put together with other people, with the, I mean the, 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 the economic actor, yeah. with, the, with the people living there, but on which you create the sense of community. I mean, that is more interesting, the, the problem of how you recreate a, a place where you want to live than to identify these with a, a, wor a work of architecture. Yeah. Myself, I don't care about the work of architecture in that sense, because uh -huh. mm. on the other side, you want to live in, in this moment, in this world, and to see in relation to what are the possibility, which is the best possibility. And it's not this exhibition that is, telling, is helping me to understand what is a path mm -hmm. to get a good possibility of life, I mean. Right. Good possibility is how the young people live, what mm -hmm. your kids yeah. can play. But, but art yeah. does the same. Has Excuse me? Uh, art, uh, public art has the same concerns yeah. as you guys have. So, in a but way, we're all as doing you guys. this. Not, uh, no, not all the guys. No, <laughs> but uh, no, uh, uh, public art has the, exactly the same concerns. The community, who's going to see it, uh, that it goes well into the space. So in a way, we're pretty much yeah. the same, and we're yeah. working for the same purpose. So uh, we're from different angles, but it all goes to the same Yes, but idea. what I critic is that is architecture is not working in that sense. Because uh, when you were saying... If you are doing a piece of art, which is a piece, I mean, there was a long discussion with my master, who was, was younger, with Sotsas and Memphis. Yeah. Memphis is design or was not design, you know? Mm -hmm. And yeah. I, I was very young, and I was discussing, saying, it's not design, it's art. And he was getting mad because I was saying that Memphis was art. And Memphis was art, was not design. Because you, if yeah. you were putting a book in the, in the shelf, was not nice to see the book <laughs> on the shelf because the yeah. piece of furniture was nicer without the book. So, if you are talking of art, you know that what you are doing. But if you make a piece of architecture as a piece of art, and not, let's say, not to make names, Zadid in Istanbul. I don't know who there is here in a Turkish architect who knows what I say. I, or, or in Milano. I, nobody wants to go to live in a place like that. So, I mean, Call us, make, uh, say, okay, let's start from scratch. But he's still talking about objects. Yeah. He's still talking about stuff that you put together. He's not talking about what you need. Could you, could you, could you tell me that, that we don't have this word? Can you tell me what disegno means? It's got a little d. 
I never thought about. <laughs> tell me. You tell me. No, I don't know. I'm not, I, you know, and I am a self thought. <laughs> I didn't study. <laughs> so it, it's not a but profession, this, it's a today, word. Today, <laughs> then I got. <laughs> no, I, it, it if somebody not. knows, we ask to the public. Anyone, who, who can somebody describe, more. Uh, who can describe the Zenyo? Anyone? No hands up? No, the D of Zenyo, the Zenyo. But anyway, just Sorry. to close okay. the, the subject, I mean, uh, we have the same concern if, if, if the base is the same. Yeah. If you are sitting in a, I don't like, I don't like to use the, uh, with a bunch of people, I, I don't want to say multidisciplinary, but if you, if you share the destiny of, of your life, of your community. I mean, We're constructing a better world, all of us, in a way. So I think people add to a better world different things. Yes, from different angles, and frontiers are no longer very important. That's what uh, I think we were talking here. Designs become artists, artists try to do sculpt, uh, architecture, architectures try to be artists. So, in a way, at this moment, I feel that you know, the professions and the frontiers are blurred, and in a way, it doesn't, it doesn't count anymore. What it counts is the quality of the works, and what they add to a new world, and what they add to the future. That's what it counts. It's not if you're this or that. I but what I also think is that, um, well, we, for us, we have something which is, uh, which is clear. If we make an art piece, we're dealing with construction and deconstruction. And if they present architecture, it's always about construction. And that's what you're saying as well, yeah. that it's like, you know, you, they present objects, you know? And then you look to the object and then you think it's about construction. But in art, you know, you have those two sides. And I think um, it would be very interesting if you, if you make an architectural biennial where you also talk about deconstruction, you know? Actually, somewhat... Uh, uh, sorry, uh, on, uh, sorry, in my, uh, my opinion. On this issue, I mean, you can imagine that a future life anyway is not related to such a fixed architecture because also now that you not. show barracks or you show... There are other ways of living. You know that my, my biggest concern for the project we are doing is why architecture and uh, architecture to build is so expensive. And why, what's the difference between a total and expensive place in Africa? Yesterday I was walking by chance and I, 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 there was an exhibition of architects building in Africa. Mm. So you, 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 you see what they do. So what, what is the difference? Why here has to be so expensive Perhaps and the, so fixed? Perhaps and the mayor, so it's all the mayor of Venice could, uh, could <laughs> tell you. <laughs> but it's, it's a problem, you know, it's a problem uh, of, uh, uh, it's a cultural problem of the value of the building. Yeah. When you take away the, 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 the foundry, the fondo, the, yeah. the, uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the value of the building, you change the parameters. Right. And that parameter you can change. Yeah. You can live, I can live in a barrack. I don't need to live in a super insulated, one of those things that you, Sorry, to, you make a fart in September and you keep it till May because <laughs> you are super insulated. You can open a window because it's very bad. They tell you. A few days ago, somebody in this conference of, uh, uh, about architecture materials said, ah, no, you cannot open the, the, the windows. It's stupid to open the windows. I say, that's crazy. It's stupid to open the window. Why? I want to open the window in winter when it's cold. No, yeah. you have to stay closed like Sigillato. Uh, <laughs> uh, does it make sense? So there is so much potential. There is so much things happening. You have to decide what, what your life has to be. You have to dream your life. Yeah. It's another parameter. It's not stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I, uh, I'm very fond of the idea of, uh, of us working on the edge of the jungle and civilization. I think it's a lovely, uh, a lovely phrase. I'm keeping that. But I, I would, uh, we've, I've asked my questions, I've asked dozens of questions. I wonder if anyone else would like to uh, get the mic and ask us anything. Maybe we can make it more informal. I'm not in the middle. Um, hi, I've got a question related to what you, you started, Edwin, by talking about the ancient sense of spirit of place. 
But it seems to me there's been, a, two of you talked about it, you in, uh, in connection with Anish Kapoor, and you talked about, about the Himalayas. But for a, a, a discussion about spirit of place, it seems there's a great lack of talk about spirituality or something other, or belief, that I think is inspired and makes great buildings of the past resonate. But I find it kind of a, a lack in your conversation that, that that really hasn't been, I mean, you've talked about practical things, community, reflection, but not about some other spirituality, which is how you started. Maybe that's one for you with the, with the memorial. Sorry to keep bringing the memorial up. I know it's not the only thing you've done, but it, it, is, it is one of the points at which it has to be a, a secular thing, uh, but at the same time, there has to be an element of, you call it spirituality, and I think that's probably a fair... Uh, you know, a fair idea. We, there was a lot of news recently about the 9-11 um, museum uh, where you can buy 9-11 uh, uh, cheese boards and 9-11 t-shirts and, and how you make, a, how you make a, public, a paying public attraction dignified. You have some kind of sense of sacrality. They have a, they have a morgue of, of remains down there. Uh, you know, how you square this kind of public art come sacrality come function of, of memory? That's a big question, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, uh, memory in the city. Um, I, I think it's um, with that particular project, I've done a number of memorials now, um, and uh, their only responsibility is to kind of stop people forgetting in, in one sense, and, and to an extent uh, they're one of the few buildings in our, in our building types, architectural types, that should truly um, attract attention to themselves, um, you know, to, to, to draw people in, to, to, to somehow curate an interpretive experience, um, whether that be figurative or abstract or language of um, art architecture, that's a, that's a totally separate topic for... Um, a debate, but mm. the the idea to which um, spirituality or, 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 or contemplation has a, a place in um, the the respective artists or, or architects' work on the panel, I think I think that that's that's almost a prerequisite of of, of a sensitivity for a good a, a good. Um, Good artist or, or architect, and let, let's kind of blur those boundaries again. But uh, to to make sense of of, of that time and place, um, and and to not, I, th I, I mean, I think one of the one of the interesting things about some of the work that has been flashing up on the slides is is it, it could be argued that that many of the uh, well, some of the pieces almost pre-curate. Uh, an expectant experience of the, of the work itself, and for for us, what's interesting is is that negotiation between the individual and the piece, whether it's art or architecture, and when the where where kind of great public space and great public art, you you can feel a sense of connection and you can feel a sense of um, identity. Um, and, and comprehension, but no, that's not necessarily through an instructive experience. It could be through an interpretive experience, um, and and to kind of give space and time for that contemplation. I, I think it, it, it's 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 a very kind of personal and ambiguous experience. What spirituality and contemplation is, and I'd look at it in a in a maybe expanded way in the work in the show and generally when we talk about public art there's there's a sense of place kind of obviously that's a given there's a usually a sense of material reality and i think in most of it there's a some beyond both place and material reality there's whether it's spirit whether it's consciousness whether it's a critical consciousness um spirituality is you know not excluded but it's not necessarily at the front of every artist's mind or practice or beliefs, uh, some more than others. Shirase Hushiari, whose work is shown here and who's mm. done many works in public, has specifically uh, drawn, it's not, it's not religious work, but it draws on uh, religious art from both the world of Islam and of Christianity, from the Renaissance. And there's an element of meditative practice that is part of the practice. So I guess 
her work is maybe more spiritual because that that's the way she thinks and, and the references that she brings to the work. But I suppose if you take a, a wider view, there's, there is a kind of active consciousness behind mm -hmm. all of the work. Yeah, I, I think I can hear um, us getting defensive. And um, I, I, frankly, I can't imagine why six men and a woman would make a very good job about talking about spirituality in an hour and a quarter. Mm -hmm. But uh, to be a bit specific and a, to be a little bit snaky, there's a space upstairs which you can see in very well. There are quite a lot of spaces that you can see into upstairs, uh, which you can't enter. Mm -hmm. And I would just suggest that that's quite an interesting place since none of us go to church anymore. We don't, you know, I expect we read two and a half kinds of newspaper. This is a very coded group of people. Um, there is something that humans do all the time, which is that they sense and see places which they are incapable of entering with their bodies. And that, in childhood, that's called wonder. Um, but I wouldn't want to sit on a panel and talk about wonder. It's embarrassing, <laughs> but I'm happy to do it at lunch. <laughs> yes. One more question. Sorry. Um, I'm going to cut you off as well because I'm in charge of the time and I want everyone to have lunch and see a bit more of Venice as well. But I think I've figured out why we have an architecture biennial and an art biennial. It's because the artists and the architects don't get along. And there's too many egos. I'm not, not suggesting on the panel, not, not, not for one minute, but can artists and architects ever truly collaborate on something with both their names on it, or does it just have to have the one name? Okay, uh, let no, me see. I think I'll, anyway, I'll ask you. We'll that ask you that. What, what you're talking about is it also about city planning that we forget, because, I mean, what we miss today is good city planning, because city planning is not making the interest of the community most of the time. So, is city planning that should say, we have art, we have architecture, we have common places, because that's the first draft or, of the dynamic of a place. And biennial of architecture is closer, to, of course, to the master planning than art. So, mm -hmm. I don't mind about the confusion that you are saying, but the problem is, is an ego problem, maybe. Mm -hmm. Because uh, maybe uh, what Gianna Vascocelos was saying, that uh, there is a contamination between the two, is true. But the, the big problem is that you don't sit on the same table to discuss it. So, I think that what is missing is to have the modest, the, to be, or I don't know if to say humble, or to be available to sit around the table to discuss issues, like, uh, but where you need at the same table the municipality, you need the developer, you need the, the planner, you need the architect, while all these things, most of the time they happen, there is somebody making, making a planning which is a pain in the neck, and then the architect becomes really ego and has to make something that you leave I, or you can't leave, and then somebody absolutely. else comes. Please, John. Um, you know, uh, in my world, I do have, I live with an architect and I have four architects in my studio, so I pretty much live with architects that I always have in my life. I always say that architects come from reality to create irreality, and artists come from the unreal to the real. So we, de we do two different paths to join in the same place, which is the public space for people that like sculpture in public spaces. So I think we both build the world in, from a different point of view. Of course, in our history, it, there, the sculptures would fill in the empty spaces left from architectural. So in the cathedrals, we were left with a niche. But today it's different. We no longer we no, we don't longer want the niche anymore. We want it all. That's so in a way, <laughs> so I think uh, sculptures no longer are in inside of the cathedral. They are already in the public space too. And that's the difference of today. We need to cope together. We need to work together. 
and we, we need to build the world in a different way, but together, not apart. But I'm, oh, sorry, forgive me. No, I'm the guy. Go of ahead, the, go ahead. I'm the guy of the crossbreeding, so I have to crossbreed <laughs> all the time. So I bring I bring uh, like architects and philosophers and, and scientists together, because that's I mean it's obvious that. Um, but you have to respect uh, their métier, you know. You have to respect their profession somewhere, you know. And métier, you, métier is a nicer word than. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Richard, you, uh, you work with architects, don't you? You work, I mean, you did this thing in, in, in King's Cross with Grupa, and uh, you know, you 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 do actually. You are an artist who works with architects. L lunch is coming, I promise. I, 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 um, yeah. it, it's chemical. I think it's who you like, who you want to spend yeah. time with. We don't all like each other. Uh, if I'm not, I'm really not interested in what, and in, in what it says on somebody's passport. If you're, I know a dozen architects that I can talk with happily, who I think about when I go to bed at night. Um, don't get me wrong. Um, I don't think it's, uh, I think this point about the city planner, I, I think ult ultimately I think it's to do with um, inappropriate divisions, socially and culturally. And um, the world is really run by a petty bourgeoisie who uh, have titles and enforce behavior on other people. And um, it's very, in English, you can say it's very trying. <laughs> well, as, we, as we, we describe, this is a kind of trial situation here with us sitting at the bench, and that's a good point to, to end. Thank you uh, very much all for coming. Uh, thank you, Berengo. Thank you, Listen Gallery, for a lovely show and for, and for uh, making this possible. And thank you so much to the panel for, uh, for sharing your opinions. I appreciate it. Please, bon appetit. Thank you.